I'd like th uh, to thank all of you for coming and joining us today. Um, um, I would also like to thank ADC and Bob Lombardi and Jim Roper for allowing us to present this wonderful event. So we're going to talk about implementing real-time parallel DSP on GPUs. Okay. So this is our agenda, why we've selected GPUs, the challenges that we've seen uh, and found during the implementation, some explanation on our core technology, uh, classical examples of how, different, um, of how filtering can be employed on GPUs. We will talk about what are the available things that you can try out and what will be the, our future plans and Q&A session at the end, okay? So why GPUs? GPUs have the power to process a lot of data uh, in parallel and such endeavors when they were done on audio uh, with GPUs were always um, were always found with disbelief or either even dismissed. They were very unstable in the beginning. They were leading to a lot of blue screens, a lot of kernel panics, and they weren't just viable to be used. Okay. Um, it remained hard to do so because of the architecture of GPUs using parallelization and inherently a lot of the classical DSP algorithms are sequential. Okay. So, like I said, audio data is usually one-dimensional, whereas GPUs are best suited for processing on multidimensional data, which is usually independent. Um, there are some situations where you might think that there is um, dependencies between channels, for example, the mid-side panning and things like that, but this is still hard to implement with GPUs. So, um, so, in this, so, in scenario. so yeah, this, there are several problems that we have with sequential, exactly like I said earlier. And one of the important things that we need to also look into when working with GPUs is scalability. So the solution that we have currently allows you to develop once and then use it either on premises or in a cloud-based solution like we had presented yesterday on the workshop. Um, you implement it once and it runs on both local machines or workstations that you have on premise or in the, in the cloud. I would like to give some numbers regarding uh, optim uh, comparison between CPU and GPU processing. We can see that on CPU real time finite impulse response processing, we have one. On time, and then if we use it in GPU real time, we were able to get up to 40 times faster. When talking about offline processing, we were able to get up to two times the speed with CPU based processing, but with GPU, we were able to get up to 75 times the speed. For IAR, which are inherently harder to work on for GPUs due to their dependency on previous data, we were able to get up to 10 times in real-time processing, and up to 50 times on rendering uh, when we were doing offline processing. So the idea is I would like to show and speak about more about GPU audio and the solution that we have. We would have real-time high-performance DSP with minimal latency regarding, regardless of the channel count that we have. It is no added latency, no matter the amount of channels. Um, and there is the ability to do cloud-based GPU DSP. These things truly open next-gen audio processing and production with things such as AI and machine learning and help to pave the way for new software. Okay. So the important thing is, what are the three challenges that we've faced? And the first one would be in a place where everybody knows well, and that would be the digital audio workstation. Most of the time when you use the digital audio workstation, you have a lot of chains of different effects, and there's a lot of DSP happening behind the scenes. And on each track, you have multiple different effects working together. The big challenge that we have with doing this is 
usually you cannot optimize that well on a single effect level, or on a single processing level. Um, a lot of the problems that people have with DSP on CPU are usually dropouts, high latency, overloads, and sometimes we need to get additional hardware in order to get the speeds that we need for our day-to-day -day tasks with processing. We also sometimes need to freeze our tracks and give up on the flexibility of what the plugins can give us. So, like we said earlier, uh, the CPU is not that efficient when it comes to DSP algorithms. Um, there are several challenges that we have. Um, before the, the, our technology, there were not that many different ways of doing audio and GPU. And the classical algorithms for GPU were not really suitable to work with when it was coming to the um, audio processing examples. So, currently, they're similar but very different at the same time. For GPUs, we can process data in parallel quite faster. Um, I'd like to just present really the actual challenges that we have. The first major one is the parallelism itself and heterogeneity. The second one is handling multiple tracks, especially chains. And the third one would be the managing the data transfers between CPU and GPU. First topic would be parallelism and heterogeneity. The first challenge um, centers on parallelization. In order to supply the GPU with sufficient work, we need a lot of parallel threads. And this thread count cannot be drawn from each plugin. Basically, it's impossible. And most of the time, the thread count in individual plugins is small. And it's not useful for, for sufficient uh, levering the full power of the GPU. In many cases, as we can see here, we have sequential dependency because the effects themselves have, uh, are running after one another. Okay. So the three types of parallelization that can happen, the one is inside the effects themselves. They sadly offer minor opportunities as the thread count is just low, as we can see here. The second one would be parallelization across effects. But like we said, the individual tasks in a single um, track just do not allow us to do it due, due to the sequential nature of it. Basically, the output of one effect is dependent on the, uh, the input of one effect is dependent on the output of another one. And then different tracks would have in different chains, it just increases further the complexity for the GPU. So the second challenge that we have found is how can we actually get the full information from though for all the individual tracks? Because those usually um, have a one track, uh, assign one thread per channel, and usually it supplies it with another one millisecond of processing at a time. So if you have, let's say, a thousand CPU threads, if you have a thousand channel setup, it actually provides uh, data at one millisecond rate. So for us, in order to make our solution work, we need to combine all the CPU calls and provide the GPU with a large degree of parallel work, basically giving access to all of the channels. The third challenge is actually related to the granularity of the amount of samples that we actually get between the CPU and the GPU. Um, let's say with a 96 kilohertz sampling rate, each track running on a 96 sample buffer. If we run a thousand asynchronous streams with tiny data transfers in both directions, basically we're going to crash. The GPUs and the drivers were not built in this way. So it is impossible on this side. So we have got a component that will take care of that. Uh, and we call the scheduler. I would, not like, I would now like to introduce Andres, okay. tell him more about it. Okay. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me there? 
Welcome, everybody. So, yeah, I will. I would like to introduce you a little bit to the to our core component called the scheduler, who allows us to face these three challenges. First, I would like to stress a little bit some aspect of the challenges. Um, as Roman mentioned, the GPU is a CIMD um, architecture. That means it's designed to work in parallel, executing the same program over a, a huge amount of data. And um, as he as he's showing in the in the first challenge, the problem we have is that we can do that in, at a intra effect level, but it offers um, little possibilities in the sense that the amount of data we have is not really big. But then we have this possibility of parallelizing between tracks. The problem there is that it's an heterogeneous uh, situation from the instruction point of view. We're not executing the same program over a lot of data. We have a lot of data, but the program is different. So what we actually need to do there, and that's why we introduced this scheduler component, is try to figure out how to adapt the GPU to be executing over a, a huge amount of data, but not exactly the same program in every situation. But they, they should be executing in parallel and um, maximizing concurrency and minimizing latencies in, in the pipeline of the, of the GPU, right? So our core component, well, and then, then there's this the third challenge about the memory transfer that I will also talk a little more about. So our core component, the scheduler, is essentially um, composed of two parts. One is host. Host here means uh, CPU side. It's not the same as host in the audio industry where this is the door. Host for me means the CPU side. Um, so on the host side, what we do is we try to communicate with the DAW and gather all the information from the environment. How many trucks do we have? Which are the, the parameters of, 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 of the complete environment? And try to see the full picture of what's going on and what do we need to transfer to the GPU and execute on the GPU. So with all that information, what we do is we create a blueprint, a sort of execution plan. Uh, you can think of that as a as a graph, we resolve dependencies that so we create the optimal way of executing that particular environment. We gather all the information in terms of the, buffer, the audio buffers, the audio information, and everything we need to move to the GPU. And we actually trigger uh, the GPU execution. And at that moment, we communicate with the device side of the scheduler that will essentially get that blueprint, collect the task that needs to be executed, Resolve some dependencies on device side and, and do some memory, uh, some resource management, and simply execute the plan that was designed on, on host side. And the, uh, the idea of here is that the plan will not be changing constantly. Once you set up the environment and you are actually executing your tracks uh, on the DAW side, essentially your execution plan will remain the same. There might be some parameter automation that might lead to some uh, blueprint regeneration, but the, that's the Let's say that that's, um, that will happen occasionally. It's not, you're not just re regenerating the plan for every single buffer, right? So that's where the advantage of the scheduler resides. And then at the same time, well, that, that essentially allows us to, to, to handle the first challenge. We manage to, to schedule tasks in, in what we call the warp level. What warp is the minimal execution uh, unity for GPUs, essentially 32 threads. So we can manage individual warps to be executing different, different programs on different pieces of data. And, and, and that way we manage the heterogeneous aspect of the parallelism we need to, to handle. And at the same time, we need to redesign a little bit our algorithms to at least work in parallel with 32 threads or something like that with warps. So that allows us to handle the first challenge. At the, at the same time, we, or we still have the problem of the huge amount of, of um, tracks with a huge amount of, of effects going on. Literally, we can have uh, hundreds or thousands of effects going on. So the scheduler, with this uh, ability of seeing the whole picture, would allow us to create this blueprint and optimize the use of resources for the execution of, of this uh, uh, huge amount of effects. So essentially what happens, imagine that each each arrow here is a different um, chain of FX that needs to be executed. And here we have a time window of about uh, one millisecond and a half. What we can do, or what we do in the scheduler is, we create like fixed windows of 200 microseconds for execution. And every 200 microseconds, we gather all the information together. We minimize memory transfers. 
uh, to from CPU to GPU and, uh, and back from GPU to CPU, and we trigger the executions every 200 microseconds. So essentially, um, yeah, we create this grid, and no matter in which moment of time the execution of a, of a chain appears, we don't immediately trigger it, we just postpone it for the next window. The window is very, very tiny, so we're not really introducing significant latency here. We're still way below the one millisecond latency requirement that we have. And at that moment, we got all the information together. We can gather all the data together and do a single memory transfer from the CPU to the GPU for the input data. And once all FX have triggered that they finished, we gather all the information together for the already processed FX or chains, and we make a copy out. So in the worst case, you can see that we have at, at most five, five copies from host to device and five copies from device to host. So in, in 10 memory transactions, we are able to handle a situation that in principle will be unbounded. If we have thousands of tracks and each track try to do this asynchronously, we can literally not, not handle it. No, there's no driver capable of doing that. So that's the great advantage the, the scheduler introduced and actually um, allows us to reduce the latency below one microsecond. And that essentially handles the two, the two challenges together, the memory problem and the huge amount of tracks that we want to handle. So as, um, as a few examples of um, usual situations that you, did, you are, I mean, components that you're used to work with, you, you all know the FIR and IIR filters are the basic building blocks for almost every effect. So the idea here is to talk briefly about it, about them and how, which, which is our approach to handle them. Essentially what we do for whatever component, I will just, I will just use these filters as an example, we, get, we try to optimize them already on CPU side, but keeping in mind that we need to gain the maximum parallelism possible on them. Then we port that to GPU and then we apply as platform specific optimizations like for example, we take care about the memory access pattern, how many, how much uh, shared memory we're going to use, which, are, which is the launch configuration, just how many threads, how many blocks we're going to use, and so on. We try to minimize the use of resources and maximize the performance of, the, of each individual algorithm. Here I'm talking about uh, into, in an internal effect level, right? Inside each particular processor. And then once this is, this is sorted out, we embed this into our SDK, into a, what we call a processor, and then our, our scheduler, the GPU audio component, is able to communicate with this processor and actually execute it. So, uh, simple example, FIR filter. That's a formula defining what an FIR filter is. It's essentially a convolution between uh, the input response and an input signal. The good thing about this particular definition is that you can see there's no data dependency in terms that each position of the output, do I have a mouse here? Um, sorry, there. Each position of the output only depends on the input that is reading and the input response. So I can literally launch one thread for each position of the output that I want to calculate and compute all positions in parallel. And since the GPU actually allows me to, to launch hundreds or even thousands of friends or threads, I can do that very easily. Um, in that sense is that the GPU can actually do each computation in parallel and really beat the CPU in terms of performance. We can literally reduce in one order of magnitude the complexity of the algorithm. And we can go, well, even further, these are uh, like generic optimizations that you can apply already in CPU side, like instead of doing the convolution in the, in the time domain, in the, in the sort of um, um, naive way, what you can do is uh, move to the memory, to the, sorry, to the frequency domain, and, and apply the convolution in the, um, after an FFT uh, operation. That means that um, multiplications, sorry, convolution becomes multiplication of, of, the, of the signals, essentially. And then what you're doing, essentially, is you're reducing the amount of operations. The amount of multiplicative and addition operations that you have is less, but you're paying the extra cost of uh, FFT. The good point is that FFT can very efficiently be implemented in, for GPUs, right? And then the other usual optimization that, that we can apply here is the partitioning the convolution into smaller blocks, and that will, that will really help the GPU in the sense that 
if we, for example, decide to have a fixed block length and we fix that, that block size below certain resource requirements of the GPU, we can, for example, make the FFT and the whole computation fit the shared memory, and that will make the algorithm even faster. And the other example that the room mentioned and gave some, gave some uh, benchmark is for is the IAR filter. This case is not that um, happy, so to say. The problem here is that we have this data dependency. If we want to compute the, the, a given position in the output, we need to know the previous two positions. Here, the input response will be codified between the Bs and As, right? We have the X being the input, but we need to know the two previous positions of the output. So there's no parallelism possible here because um, we essentially need to process the buffer sequentially. And the, the problem goes even further. The usual use case of this is you get a bunch of filters and you have a cascade of them. So you execute uh, filters one after the other, having even more sequential processing. What we can do here is adopt a specific uh, representation of the filters. We adopted this one, state of space formulation. This is uh, the math of it. Just wanted to point out that we're using the notation from the books, so maybe the, the variable names changes here. Is, I is still the output, but X is now the state of the filter, and U is the input. A, V, C, and D will be uh, codifying the input response, the matrix coefficients. The advantage of this formulation is that it allows us to do some unrolling of, this, of the signal and compute several positions at once. In particular, we can do one level of rolling and have two inputs to compute two outputs and, and one position of, of the state to compute the next one, or actually two steps forward in this state, in this state of the filter. And here the coefficients are, the, the matrix here are not exactly the same as before. We need to rework the filters a little bit. But the advantage of this formulation is that if you take a look, x here, u, uh, xn, un, and un plus one is the same vector in every case. So essentially what we're doing here, if we rework the coefficients a little further, is to compute these free values, we are doing a matrix multiplication between some matrix and the vector xn, un, and un plus. So we can actually have a single matrix, we call it A, and just with a matrix multiplication, which is something quite common in GPUs, we can actually compute, in this case, two positions of the filter simultaneously. We can do further unrolling by paying certain, I mean, this is a trade-off. We can unroll further and do like, I don't know, 32 positions. The problem is that the size of the matrix will increase. That means more memory requirements, uh, more memory transfer, so the, the access pattern should be carefully studied to see if the cache hits are proper and so on. But the, the sh you should be able to find a, a point, a trade-off point, where your algorithm will be optimal for certain matrix size uh, and, and uh, amount of, of filters, of, of sorry, coefficients being um, computed in parallel and which your algorithm will be the, the, the best thing you, you, you can do on, on, on a given GPU. The advantage of, um, of this approach is that, uh, as I mentioned, matrix is a well-known operation, and, and you can play a lot with memory access pattern and, and the cache hints and make um, the GPU, for example, load the whole matrix in parallel. Then you do some, some multiplications, and at the end, at the very end, you have a synchronization step where you share the, that, the data that is dependent between the samples. And, you can, and with this approach, we can go even further. And for the second case of the cascading filter, we can re, redesign the topology of our filters, decompose them differently, so that the filters, instead of being applied in a sequence, as is, as is, as it is the usual case, we can apply them in parallel. And in the end, essentially, we just sum the results of the, of the different signals, and we get what originally was a cascade of many filters, and each filter was sequential individually. Well, now we, can, we have a certain amount of parallelism in, in each individual filter, but at the same time, we are computing all the filters in parallel and gathering all the results together at the end. So we actually, that's how we actually were able to improve the performance by uh, taking advantage of the parallelism the GPU gave, gave us. Um, so this is a little bit the big picture of our solution. We talked about the, the main component, GPO, the component included the scheduler and all this uh, memory transfer management and so on. And what we provide with it is uh, two SDKs. 
one we call the DSP SDK is essentially what you see from the plugin side or the application side, how do you communicate from your application with the engine, how do you provide uh, which FX you wanna, um, you wanna execute, which are your, your chains of FX that you want to execute, which is your input data and so on. And on the other side of the, of the solution, we have the processor API, which is how you create processors so that our engine can execute your processors. Um, and then there's a fourth component that we plan to, to have available, which is essentially this kind of algorithms I just mentioned, the IR filter, FIR filter, and many more. It's a library of uh, DSP, common DSP algorithm and data structures already designed to execute on GPUs, so already redesigned for parallelism. So, um, Ruben, do you want to continue with, yep. with this part? Okay, thank you. So, Okay, so we would like to also show you what is currently available, what are the pros that we've released, and what is the roadmap for the next steps. At the moment, we have our early access Fear Convolution uh, VST3 plugin. You can go and download it. We have our beta modulation suite as well that has, that has um, chorus, phaser, and flanger. And you can just go and download them in a VST3 format for Windows. Um, we're currently supporting AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. Um, yeah, we're supporting from NVIDIA 10,000 series upwards and the latest several generations of AMD. So, we're, the VST3 is currently supported and we're working on implementing it on the audio unit in AEX sites, yeah, on Mac OS. Um, and now for the big surprise, we are working on a synthesizer, a hybrid eight layer synthesizer that has a little bit of everything. Um, with eight independent layers, you have 16 voices per oscillator and different envelopes, internal cascade of different effects, such as a chorus, EQ, delay, and a spectrum analyzer. Okay. Uh, we're currently working with Mac One on providing multi-channel solutions based on GPU audio solution as well. Um, we're open for working with any, any company that is willing to provide their products to our solution. And yeah, that's it. At the moment, yes, we have our early access. We launched early, our early access back in June. The beta suite was re uh, released last month. We have Apple M1 support planned for winter this year. The GPU powered synthesizer. And in 2023, we expect to release multiple different partner collaborations, including Mac One. So, you can go and, yes, you can go and download the early access product from this QR code, but I believe we have some demos that we can show, Andres? Yep. yep. Yeah, uh, so before we do some q and A, I I would like to, to do some little demo of, of the product so that you get an, an, an idea of what's going on. So, um, just give me one second and look for one file. What I would like to show you first of all is a performance test of one of our processors that you can find in the, I hope the font is big enough, that this is one of the processors that you can find on the modulation bundle. This is a chorus processor. I'm gonna explain you a little bit what the test is about. Essentially what we're going to do is launch uh, 350 instances of a chorus processor in parallel, well, not, not really the 350 in parallel, what we're going to do is change of two processors, so it's 175 instances, it's, sorry, 175 chains of, two, of uh, two stereo processors, so it's 350 instances overall, 700 uh, channels that we're processing. Um, just one second and I'll, I'll get the, configuration file so you can take a look at it. Yeah, there we go. 
So the idea is of, of this performance test is simulate the, the execution on a, on a DAW in an asynchronous uh, scenario. By asynchronous, I mean we're trying not to block the, the feeding of block buffers. So as soon as we have an, an X buffer available, we send it to the, to the platform instead of waiting for the, execute, for the finishing the previous execution. So what I'm going to do is run uh, a thousand times um, with buffers of one millisecond. Uh, the, well, the sample rate is not here, but the sample rate is fixed to 96K, so 96 samples is, is one millisecond of audio. So I'm running with the same granularity, meaning I'm trying to process the whole buffer in parallel, internally. Two channels per processor, 175 instances of a chain that has two chorus processors, okay? This is the same chorus processor you, you can find in the modulation bundle. So I picked that number because I know in the current state of this computer that's more or less the limit of this computer. So I would expect eventually to get some drop so let me run the, the test and I will explain you what, what the results mean. So this is initialization things and loading. Here what I get is for each individual chain, the, um, the summary of what happened after the 100 runs, uh, 1,000 runs, sorry. So essentially what happened is, for example, if we take this chain, I have an average latency of uh, almost one millisecond. It's almost there. I have a leading latency that is not too different from the, from the average one. I have five missed packages, but a five catch-ups. That means that when executing some buffer in five occasions of the 1,000, it wasn't able to finish on time, but on the next iterations, it, it catch up, meaning that you won't hear an audio drop there. And in the end, if you take a look, well, this went pretty well. Essentially, you have the same, the same situation in every single chain. So in the end, I don't know if the last line below is being properly seen. Uh, let me, oops, sorry, let me do that. The last line has the, the average of the complete test, which is essentially the same of the random chain that I picked before. We have five misses and five catch-ups in general, and you can see that the numbers are pretty consistent in terms of the average latency of the leading latency is almost the same in general. So this means I was actually able to process 700 channels in parallel without, uh, without audio drops. In, in, in this laptop that has, just for you to, have, to get a reference, this has an RTX 2070 GPU by NVIDIA. It's a cheaper, so it's low-end GPUs. Um, if you allow me, I would like you to actually listen to what, well, maybe not listen, but see that processor in working to, so that you actually see that, that there's a processor behind that. It's not just numbers in the screen. So what I will do is I will open a door and I will create a, some simple test situation with a generic testing plugin that we have that will allow, allow me to load any, any of our processors. So for you to get an idea, I will, create, I will put there a tone generator. And um, well, the audio feed is going through my computer, not through the PA. I don't think you, you, you will be able to listen to it, but let me put um, a spectrum analyzer so we actually see the wave. There, let me increase the, mute it. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I thought it was not going through, my bad. Um, so now I will, oh, let me, let me move this away from there so that it keeps it on screen. Now I will add one of our processors. The moment I add the, the generic plugin, we will lose the audio because you, you see that the signal disappears because I, I then need to select which processor I want to use. This is a generic plugin without graphic interface that we use for testing. So here I select the chorus and I go here and I got all the parameters available. And let me move it there so that the spectrum analyzer actually sees the chorus working. And I have the muted signal, right? There it is. 
So now you can see the wave is different, and I can actually play with the parameters, have different form, waveforms. This is the exact processor we just performed the benchmark with the other test. And this is the processor you can download from the modulation bundle and use it with a funny graphic interface that is much more convenient. So um, I don't recall, how, how do I add the monitor so that you see this, the latency is below one millisecond? I know it's somewhere around here. Sorry? It should be on the right side. There. Here? Yeah. Mm, no, I get a window, a different, I get this window, let me say. Well, sorry, I don't, uh, where? There? Well, you can always download the early access. Yeah, yeah, there, there's a monitor that I don't know how to add. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I just wanted you to, to see the number of the screen, but I don't know how to add the monitor that comes with this though. But the idea is that. So essentially, that, that's the live demo we wanted to do for you. And uh, now we are open for questions. Uh, so the Q&A session will begin.